Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Toward a Quality of Life here in the month of July, the year 2008. Broadcasting to you from the BNN TV studio on Washington Street, Roxbury, Massachusetts. We are going to start with a little uh, spirituality or religiosity, shall we say, just for the heck of it. So I will start the show doing this. And I would ask also, please, that um, people in the control room, please sort of keep it down so that I won't be hearing it. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. And here we go. We are going to start it this way. Oh. rendition of Om, the chant or the, or the tonality used by Buddhists as they try to meditate and levitate. Let me try it one more time. Oh. can do it quite longer. I guess I must be a little bit uh, not able to do it right now on a moment's notice, because usually I can make it go very long. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> regarding the OM to start the show, not that it's going to be a spiritual show, but the idea that there's more to live for than the things that we are typically thinking about and living for in our very materialistic and commercialistic society that there are higher aspirations and more human and humane kinds of aspirations to have than the ones that we have. And speaking of religion, uh, while on the topic, uh, I'd like to make the point here that of all the religions from Islam to Catholicism to Judaism to Hinduism to Buddhism, which is kind of Buddhism being the ultimate enactment, in a way, of what we have for religion in this world, all of the basic principles of the religions come together if you sift them out and come down to the core philosophies. And one of the main philosophies in Buddhism, as in other religions, though not accentuated perhaps as much, is denial of the materialism, denial of the... Um, denial of the uh, things that just make us, someone's asking me, where, do I, where am I supposed to move? Someone's asking me to move here. Am I in the right spot now? Thank you. Uh, denying uh, bodily pleasure, denying hedonism, denying just living for the day, denying anything goes, denying no standards, denying to just do whatever you please and satiate your body and your senses and your mindset for whatever you will. All religions filter down to a negation of that, and especially the Buddhist religion. And also one other thing comes to mind as I'm talking about the Buddhist religion, which is that, um, of course, you've heard of the Dalai Lama. And uh, uh, someone went to see him. I'm, I'm getting signals here. You'll have to excuse me. What is that signal? I, I don't know what it is. but. This is where I am. Am I in a wrong spot? Thank you. Uh, the Dalai Lama um, uh, has a home, although he's all over the world, as you know, and a lot in the United States. He has a home in northwestern India. And that area is so sublime. And I heard someone who happened to be able to know the Dalai Lama talk about having gone to visit him at his home. And he went down this foggy, remote area in northwestern India. And believe me, there's nothing in that area. It's very arid land with very little vegetation and so on. And uh, he went there and finds this house after nothingness way deep in the yonder. And um, 
he was asking the Dalai Lama a number of questions, and one of the responses that the Dalai Lama gave to him about people who go after Buddhism or go after this spiritualism and want to adopt the religion because they do see it as a higher order principle, should not do it if they are not born and bred into the Buddhist philosophy and are willing to take up the very arduous life that is called for in being a devotee of Buddhism. In fact, I know an awful lot about Catholicism and the other religions as well. And if you are to be a real devotee of them, you take up a very arduous life if you were to live those religions to the letter of the law. But it was very interesting to hear the Dalai Lama say, don't jump into Buddhism if that's not your natural uh, birthright, so to speak, or birth philosophy where you're willing to take up what it really means to be genuinely a Buddhist, but maybe just use some of the principles and adapt them to the way that you live. And uh, one other funny thing about the Dalai Lama, too. I, I, I remember once reading that someone was questioning him of what to do uh, when things bother you, because, of course, the Buddhists very much follow a, a, a philosophy of nonviolence, very important to them. And that would not be like the Catholic or Judaic religion, for example, which espouse, or Muslim religion, which espouse the just war, that if there's a just reason to be at war, you can commit violence, but not in Buddhism. So uh, the Dalai Lama was being asked, what do you do if people are bothering you? What do you do if an animal's bothering you? What do you do if a mosquito is bothering you? And so the Dalai Lama says, when it comes and sits on your skin, just flick it away. And the person said, what if it comes back? And the Dalai Lama says, you flick it away again. And he said, and it returns again, buzzing around. He says, you flick it away again. He said, it still comes back. He says, you swat it with a smile. So that was kind of a cute thing that even in a Buddhist philosophy, uh, there are ultimate situations that just aren't bearable for human beings and perhaps have no other recourse than, than to be swatted. But it hardly means to go to war as, after fellow human beings or after animals or after the environment or after each other. Anything regarding that has solutions no matter how long they take, and they will take long, that must be nonviolent. Now, Secondly, as we always start the show, uh, I have here the plastics that are so bad for you, and I'm on my own mini campaign against plastic. And look at this, this cup that I got at Starbucks. And by the way, quite a few people I was reading are happy that Starbucks is having to close 600 stores uh, as they're economically not feasible. And uh, every day, people get drinks and something like this. Look at how undestructible this is. I mean, we, in theory, could have this as glasses in our home to be used for a very long time. And yet, they're given out to people on a daily, on a multi-million basis, such plastic like this. Not biodegradable, screwing up the ocean, screwing up life and uh, very bad for us in its being made, very bad for us if the sun hits this in our Coca-Cola or whatever we have and we're drinking it, we're drinking plastic. We're drinking plastic with, with whatever contents are in there. And then you have the milk bottle. This is from Gerlich. And I show you these two as sort of the harder plastics. And as far as plastics go, uh, as uh, be, in being in touch with food and our body and so on because the skin is a living organ and the skin takes in molecules and elements as well. Everything we put against our skin or even uh, gases in the air go in through our skin or can go in. So, uh, so always remember your skin is as much a living organ as your liver or your heart. So it's not just a covering for your body. So these harder plastics, at least, are less likely to exchange uh, their materials with whatever it is that's con contained in them. Uh, this one is a softer. This is a milk carton. And uh, uh, there, there will be, as time goes on, much more uh, evidence presented and much more of a push against plastic. And one of the ways you can know this even is I saw that the plastic industry has been making some commercials from time to time telling us 
how great plastic is, how the world cannot live without plastic. And of course, plastic is a petroleum-based product, and we all know about petroleum. Maybe as, as petroleum becomes so expensive, maybe that'll be another impetus to get rid of plastic and go back to glass, which is the correct kind of container to be having, and better yet, that we all bring our own containers to the market so that we don't keep replicating millions of containers that have to get trashed somewhere, even if they're glass. Because we are so full of garbage. The world is full of garbage. We are a dump. Now, I will do with these plastics, as I always do, we're going to get plastic out of our life. So let's get rid of plastic. No to plastic. And if you have young children, you don't want them sucking on those pacifiers with the soft plastic with the phthalates in it, which is definitely known to exchange with the mouth and with, uh, with, human, with human life, with human life, with what it gets in touch with. So, and I'll tell you another story about plastic that happened to me recently. I was in a grocery store in a small town that has a big fish department, and it steams fish for people if they want it steamed, uh, prepared to eat. So uh, I gave my order to have some fish done, and then I walked away, and I happened to return when they were just putting my fish in, and it was into an autoclave steamer that gets very hot indeed. You know, they, they, they push the door shut, and it's really in a container like you see in a dental office where they sterilize the instruments they're using in an autoclave. So I see the person who's cooking the fish put down one of those thin plastic bags like you see in the grocery store for produce that you put your produce in. She puts one of those on the pan, and then she puts the fish down to put it into this very hot oven, essentially. I go, what are you doing? She says, I'm putting this plastic in, whatever for, so that the fish won't stick to the pan. I couldn't believe it. Another customer there couldn't believe it. Now, this plastic is going to be heated to a very high temperature along with the fish. So I went to the managers and said, do you realize that this is a, a terrible practice, a toxic practice? They, they, they just looked at me with still looks like, we don't know if what you're saying is true and whoa, and they said they'd take it up with corporate. So in the meantime, and I saw a whole big bin of these plastic bags that had been used already, and, 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 and so the toxicity's in there anyway from all the times it's been being used. So um, I called the uh, health department of the town, and I said, told the man what, what the, uh, what the situation was, and, and so he said to me, when I explained it to him, he said, yeah, and he wanted to know, well, why was I calling after I told him? And when I told both the managers and this public health person that this is why also you're told to not use most plastics in a microwave, that that, and in case people do use them, you're not supposed to, so anyway, he, he was uh, not happy about my call, and he's supposed to look into it, and I don't know the answer. So just to find out uh, if I'm not totally uh, uh, extreme, and I know I'm not for my own purposes and my own knowledge, I called the state to find out what their opinion would be. And the minute they heard this practice, they were quite appalled and needed to know uh, the details, and I'm saving, you know, the outcome. I'll work with the town first, and then, if not, then, then the state. But uh, the state's idea was this was uh, definitely not a doable situation, and yet the store was doing this every day, all the time, on all the people's foods. And it seems to me that you wouldn't need to read that plastic when it heats exchanges. You just need to smell. You just need to know that a plastic bag melts instantly. It's something that you can know by being aware. You've got to know more things than just what the TV is telling you, just what the TV is conditioning you to, just what the videos are conditioning to you. 
to you. you. You have to know things for yourself, and you can know them by keeping your eyes open and your ears open, and just think that you've got a little mental engine that works. And when you go around this world and you have motivation, you can see things and hear things and know things just by being aware and having your engine on as you go around the world. And then maybe at night, when you're ready to relax, you can shut your engine off and cool down, maybe with some uh, little movie on TV, of which there are very few that won't indoctrinate you to uh, paranoia and uh, uh, fear and uh, an idea that violence and nastiness and treachery is a way of life, that everything is beast against beast, human against human, in most evil, uh, devious devious ways. This is what your brain will get fed. And this is what the brains of our children who do not have cognitive capacity developed to even know how to think yet. Children actually, besides learning the contents of what the world is about, that fire is hot and that, that if you fall on a rock it's hard and it hurts your head and that juice tastes a certain way and some other things taste not so good, and so on. Besides just learning the contents of what life is about, children actually need 11, 12, 13, 14 years, that's 18 years, that's why we get the age of majority, and so on, to even develop cognitive structures, cognitive abilities to be able to think at all. So they're getting fed all this horrible garbage before they even have the ability to think for themselves and know how to figure stuff out. Their brains are being formed into these evil and malicious uh, mindsets. Now, <clears throat> several times that I've been here, uh, I've talked about the election that is going on in the year 2008. And uh, at the last time I spoke, uh, it was still a toss-up between Hillary and Barack, and we're now at a time in July of 2008 that the nominee will be Barack Obama. And so I thought I would say uh, a few thoughts on the generalities of what's going on in general about this election and uh, the feelings uh, and thoughts of a person whose heart belongs to Hillary. Uh, even though I'm not enamored of her, maybe I wouldn't even like her as a human being, I like what she stands for and how she carried out what she stands for. In fact, my heart belongs to the Clintons, to both Bill and Hillary. Uh, I do admire them. Sure, are they full of warts? Are they full, full of flaws? Are they human beings? Yes, they are. But all things uh, being equal, uh, I am uh, a fan of both Clintons and of their daughter. And I will tell you, and I, I guess I belong to that demographic. I fit some of that demographic of the white, older female, supposedly uneducated, uh, who is for Hillary. That's the demographic I've been pigeonholed into. Um, I will tell you that overall, considering how Hillary finished in the race before she, after she got herself together, not knowing uh, what hit her when Barack came around the corner unbeknownst to her, uh, not having planned for that at all, and really having made a lot of bad errors in her campaign. Um, but after that, in the way she picked up and went full speed ahead, I will say as a female, from a female point of view, that I never saw anything till I saw Hillary. And I guess she stands for me and for a lot of other people uh, in this country and the world as, uh, as an inspiration of what can be done and what must be done and what will be done as we go into the, into the future. Um, the, the thing, and I, and I must say too that when I say because Hillary was a female and 
and I'm for her as, and it, a lot of the feminist uh, characteristics that I can pull out of that are important to me. I must repeat that were it some other female, that would definitely not automatically get my vote. It's the fact that she was so knowledgeable that she could not be moved, that she had such a steady hand, and of course, I like, for the most part, her policies. Maybe not every one, but I am favorable to her policies, and most definitely to a national health care. I cannot wait, nor can most physicians, most psychologists, wait for a time when we will have a national health care in this country, and hopefully, which I don't think will happen, not the way it's being talked about, that there would not be uh, HMOs in between uh, the patient and the doctor. So, uh, in Hillary, I saw someone who could not be moved, who was like a rock, who could not be moved and who wasn't all over the place, who had the same answer, who wouldn't apologize for her vote on Iraq, who wouldn't say that she would get troops out lickety-split, that it was going to take some doing and understood all the big uh, practicalities and politicalities that have to do with trying to get troops out of Iraq. And I, and I would like to emphasize once again that so many beautiful and well-versed African Americans stood with Hillary to the very end, or to the very end at least w before she went uh, into that uh, sort of hiatus where no one saw her for a while. And they did so uh, because they had worked with her, and they knew her, and they knew where she stood. Now. Barack Obama is the uh, uh, supposed nominee, the likely nominee, uh, formally speaking, when the convention happens in August. And uh, I must say to you at this time, uh, though I will vote democratically, I, I basically don't vote Republican. And I forgot to mention that um, the, the last time we had a... Uh, uh, a bunch of candidates, and I was talking about them, that are long gone now. There was another candidate who impressed me uh, very much, and that was Mike Huckabee on the Republican side. He, he really impressed me, though, of course, now he's out of the race. But none of the others, they all leave me, including the two choices now, they leave me, as apparently they leave a lot of people that I run into, uh, kind of uh, lackluster, not knowing what to do. That's why you see a very big group of undecided people that still exist in the country as to what they're going to do. And um, I will, uh, uh, unless something happens that I'm not aware of, I will uh, probably pull the lever. I certainly won't pull it for McCain. Um, I will pull it for Obama. Uh, but I don't have a heck of a lot of faith in so doing. Um, we, we, I, I, do, I find that he has uh, not a lot of depth of understanding as he goes about. He's a great, uh, great with words, great with giving a speech, although his speech has never roused me, and I, I guess there are people that, that they never roused, and those motivational speeches now are, are, are not, not what he can do, he now must talk policy so people can know what he stands for going into the election rather than just hope. But, but you see him switching positions all over the place. He said the gun ban was constitutional. Now he says uh, it's okay that uh, the ban is deemed unconstitutional. Uh, certainly he's changing his position on Iraq. Uh, he did vote for funding that war throughout the time he had a vote in the say of that. Um, he, he's, he's, he's changing up on, he speaks about uh, Jerusalem, he speaks in front of one audience, the Israeli audience, that it's sacred. He speaks in front of a Palestinian audience and he says it's negotiable. So you see an awful lot of zigzagging. There's a whole number of issues that he's just leaving behind his former position and taking on another one sort of like as he bumps into the people's reactions or as he bumps into what are going to be the real issues with trying to do anything on a particular situation, then he adjusts himself, whereas 
the candidate that I was for, I believe, already knew where she stood on those. Of course you change as certain things happen, but not to this degree. And as far as having advisors advise you, uh, we just had George Bush, who really had no depth of understanding. Of course, uh, he's, he also did not have the education and abilities that Obama has in speaking and articulating, needless to say. But the idea of having to rely on see what happens as you go or to have advisors uh, tell you, uh, that, that's not a very comforting, comforting idea. And it's also hard to know what Obama really does want to do. I cannot get a grip on it because he is all over the map and seeming to adjust as he moves forward in time. So uh, that's worrisome to me, very, very worrisome to me. And um, he might have an agenda. He might, but uh, I really can't see it right now. And, um, and uh, I also worry about some of the acquaintances not knowing much about him, and we still don't know much about him. I worry about some of the people that are in support of him and with whom he has had dealings as a grown person, such as people who have been in the weathermen, and I'm, I'm well aware of who the weathermen were. They did the bombings in the 70s. They were an offshoot of the SDS from the 60s. And uh, certain of them have been involved with him uh, in, in recent years, and some of them have not repented. They feel good about what they've done in the past, uh, bombing uh, federal locations and police, uh, police situations. And uh, one of them, this William Ayers, whose name keeps coming up, is, um, uh, is a professor, and he's a professor in education. And uh, from having looked this up, I never realized this. He got off on the bombing charges, which he admits to as having done on a technicality. There was a trial for him and his wife. But uh, he is pushing, and I guess he's pretty influential in education, he is pushing that so-called social justice be part of the school curriculum in the United States. So he's and who knows where these people stand and what. The problem is it's the far left. Now, I am definitely left, and I am definitely on the more social and socialistically oriented side, so to speak, of things. But the far left can be worrisome because um, you don't know when, when these things get out of hand and they get some authority and they get some control, not to say that this is Obama, but people whom he's, he's been involved with, uh, they can be very um, uh, uh, black and white, sort of like the right. The far left is like the far right. It's an all or none. It's black and white. And so many times in history, when people want to make the kind of society they feel is just, they work on eradicating people who don't agree with this, their ideas, whether they are in the far left or the far right. And it's worrisome, too, that people would follow a leader, just every hope is in the leader, uh, not known exactly why, but the hope is in the leader. And the hope comes at a time when the country's in a really bad condition, looking for anything to help it into the future. And also, uh, never, this person, Reverend Flegler, a uh, 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 Catholic priest, a white Catholic priest, uh, oh my goodness, he had a lot of association with Obama, and he is a nut in plain English, and he is some kind of out of control person. So uh, some of these things give me pause. And then uh, I, I noticed too that Obama would not appear on the Tavis Smiley program this year, his annual uh, convocation of all things having to do with African-American issues in the United States, and Obama refused to attend, and I guess Tavis Smiley uh, made some public statements uh, in not being very happy, critical public statements. And uh, also, Obama would not let the, the person from Minnesota, who's the first Muslim, uh, I don't know if he's, he must be a representative in Congress, Ellison, Al Ellison, would not, let, would not let him appear with him at some function because he's Muslim. And we had the two girls with the headscarves who could not be in the picture because it was Muslim. And uh, the slickness, too, of one day in the Senate, 
uh, moveon.org was up for a vote as uh, for people to vote as to whether to criticize them. It must have been over that General Petraeus when they called him General Betraeus. And there was a Senate vote of, of should we, should we uh, criticize them, at, even though they're Democrats, that this is not what we do as Democrats. And then there was another vote on something, I forgot what, right behind it. They were neck and neck. So Obama's whole uh, catapult to where he is now, and he's catapulted a lot, is from moveon.org, sort of a far-left organization that uh, really wanted the Iraq war ended and so on and was, wouldn't, wouldn't hear anything but someone that would say we're ending it immediately, which might be changing now, and they're supposed to be unhappy about that. But anyway, they were what's called his base, his roots, his, the people that, that brung him, and I use that word loose, you know, brung him, that's not really a word, but I'm using it, uh, brung him to, to uh, his first part of this whole journey. And uh, guess what? Conveniently, he failed to vote on the move on, whether to criticize them, and Hillary voted to not criticize them, even though they're, they're very, uh, that, I'm not saying that makes her better or anything, but he, he, he voted on the second issue. They were neck and neck, and he managed to not vote on the move on, one way or another. So... All this, you know, how he's zigzagging his way, and I still can't get a grip on, on, on what it is, what is the agenda. It's still, still like a blank slate, still like uh, an empty suit, still, still wondering. And, and yet, so I will, I will um, but I will say this, Obama likely will be the president, and if he is the president, he will have won fair and square, and he will have won as the will of the people. No one can deny that. So it's the will of the people that must be heard. And uh, I remember, and also, as time goes on, I may grow to admire him greatly. I will wait and see. I, will, I may grow to admire him. Now, in the last Democratic election, I, uh, I, I voted for Kerry, and I had to vote for Kerry really wishing I didn't have to, but there was George Bush. I had to vote for Kerry, and that's how I felt. But this time, when I place my vote, which I believe I will do, I will vote like this, with a limp hand. I will vote limply. And I think so many people are facing uh, a kind of a not knowing. We didn't have a very good field of candidates, uh, generally speaking, to choose from this year prior to now when they all were first there to begin with. And the next thing that I wanted to point out is that uh, I will, as now new evidence could come my way, anything could change any time. And are we dealing in a black and white world uh, as far as uh, are things ambiguous or are they crystal clear one way or another? No, they are not crystal clear one way or another. And people are human and they have all their faults as well as their positives. Uh, given that, within that context of knowing nobody's perfect and sometimes they do things that are quite imperfect, but yet, overall, uh, you like what they've done as it goes for the country and for the people, I would never, uh, so far, unless I see some further information, I will never disavow Bill Clinton or Hillary Clinton the way they have been disavowed. I will never do that, and I will never, ever, uh, so far, uh, feel anything or think anything that Bill Clinton could possibly be a racist. I would like to know to this day how saying that in North Carolina that Jesse Jackson won the same two precincts or wards, whichever they were, or, or I forgot what they were called, how big the areas were, the, that Jesse Jackson won them, because of the African-American vote, I cannot see how that could ever, ever be uh, considered a racist statement. And uh, it reminds me of what happened to Bill Clinton, and I do believe perhaps it was used by the other team that they were waiting to pigeonhole him. Uh, but I, I think it's sort of like Michael Jackson, who I think has been uh, in a way, maligned beyond what maligning should ever happen, from being the greatest gift to people that tore at their hearts, remember the white gloves, and remember the world really loved Michael Jackson. And what did they love? 
They loved that he was bringing forth love. That's what they could feel out of Michael Jackson. I'm looking at the man in the mirror. And look at what he is now, detested. It's been managed to be that he's detested and despised. It's the old thing of put him up as the greatest, greatest person the whole world would know in the villages of Cambodia. They were wild about Michael Jackson in, at his pinnacle and bring him down to the most detested, uh, slovenly thing on the planet who gets probably ill treatment, uh, you know, not very close to him, but in general, wherever he goes around the world. It's not right, and, and that's what we seem to do. And as far as that goes, I sort of think that Hillary's kind of like a Britney Spears where uh, no one wants her to succeed, but they sure do want to know what she's wearing, what she said, how close she got to this and that. They, they need to know every breath she's taking, but they don't want for her to uh, get ahead or certainly to be the president. So what we're doing here is making, in the case of Bill Clinton, a beloved figure into a, uh, a, a, a figure who, whom we can spite. And let us remember how beloved he was in nations around the world. And when he left office, he had a 65% approval rating. And uh, most people, if they weren't of the anti-abortion and prayer in school and evolutionary uh, beliefs, uh, disbelief and, and, and all those kinds of features, anti-gay and so forth, uh, which I'm not giving a position on those one way or another, uh, most everybody else thought he was just fine and dandy. And I will say, too, that uh, Barack Obama, early on, some time ago, when it was still uh, an, all, an early part of the race, uh, actually dissed Bill Clinton, which I found, which now we know that Bill Clinton is angry. He's not out there. Supposedly, he's angry. He's not out there campaigning for him. He dissed Bill Clinton publicly. And this is what he said, if you recall. And I, this is a Democrat speaking about one of the few Democratic presidents at all in our history, uh, beloved by Democrats and others. And he uh, dissed him. Uh, what, a, what a bold, and I, I, I can't understand the reason for it, but he said, out of the blue, no one asked him. One day he just made this statement. It wasn't in the course of a speech. It wasn't in response to a question. He kind of called the cameras in, and he said that, that Ronald Reagan changed the traje trajectory of America in a way that Richard Nixon did not and in a way that Bill Clinton did not. And if you remember that time, um, people were saying, what is he, being Reaganite? Does he believe in Reagan's policies, which we certainly don't believe in? And he was trying to explain himself that uh, uh, Reagan, uh, you know, made a new, new kind of way for the country to go, certainly not the kind of way I hope that we'll be going in the future, however this turns out in the months to come, but he really went out there and baited Bill Clinton, and now we have the situation that we have. I, I don't know, the, and, 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 I, and I read that Barack is going to Germany, and he will be giving a speech supposedly in front of the same gate that Ronald Reagan gave a famous speech when he went to Germany. So it's very interesting that he sort of took issue with him out of the blue, kind of pointed out that he wasn't that great a thing that he didn't do, make such a big difference in the country or change, change how the country was going. He certainly changed how the country was going since the time of Ronald Reagan and the elder Bush. Certainly changed it then. And uh, there are so many people who admire Reagan, but there are so many people who found that if you weren't part of the wealthiest classes, there wasn't much in a Reagan presidency for you. And, of course, we inherited that huge deficit from his profligate spending during his terms and uh, the spending that the Republicans rail against but inevitably end up doing uh, in equal step with any Democrat, if not more. So let 
Now, the other thing, too, is, uh, well, I won't get into the, the JFK comparisons because uh, there's a lot there uh, that don't bode well with me as well, but I think I will leave that aside for now. Um, and a lot is being done with that kind of an association, but that does not sit so well with me. Uh, I'm not an unmitigated fan of JFK and, and the whole family for that matter. And if you read uh, very closely about his presidency, um, there are some things that are uh, way more severe, uh, severely unpalatable than stuff we have seen in recent Democratic administrations. Okay, now, um, one thing in sum that we can learn from Hillary, and I'm sure it's been a, a message that has gone through the skins of people uh, and into their marrow of their bones, is that uh, as females, we don't back down. We don't back down. And I can tell you that as a female, um, I, I don't necessarily back down, but if I'm not wanted or can't find a way through somewhere or, uh, you know, it's people really don't want a woman. This is, you know, in, in things that I've been involved in with, with my life where all males were, were in power and if they really don't want a woman or sometimes I've been up against uh, where, okay, it was time that we'd take a woman, but the woman has to be a minority woman, an Hispanic woman, this actually happened to me, so it couldn't be a white woman, whatever. When I'm faced with uh, barriers like this, uh, I, I do go away from people that don't want me, unlike Hillary, who teaches us to continue and, and continue to go after what it is we want and what it is uh, we should be able to get. And I will say, too, about the Democratic Party at this time and the way this election has gone, that uh, there's very little room to be happy about uh, major leaders of the Democratic Party having behaved well uh, and let this be an open race and uh, also doing well in the Congress in general and with, with, with the politics of our nation in general, the race notwithstanding. I would like to say, uh, to, to fault Nancy Pelosi, who's <laughs> not a good example whatsoever, in my opinion, even though I was very pleased when she first uh, got the office and was waiting to see what would happen. Certainly not uh, Senator Harry Reid, uh, who's, who's terrible for the Democratic Party, and, and Howard Dean. Um, these people, I think, have done um, a very poor job during this election in how they've comported themselves and what the net result has been for the Democratic Party. And though I vote Democrat, um, I will vote independent as independent. I am independent. I'm not necessarily Democrat. And I will vote independent as suitable and uh, in the independent people are on the ticket, uh, as, as has happened now and then. I'd like to say something for animals. Get off the election topic. Thought I'd just bring that up at the present time. Um, as regards animals, and we always want to keep in mind how they are suffering. Mm. Excuse me. Mm. They are suffering so. And uh, in so many ways, habitat destruction, being in research, uh, being on the street abandoned, uh, getting killed by cars, getting mistreated by owners, every which way the vast majority of animals are in really bad trouble, all the way from uh, the little moles and the little squirrels and the little, the little uh, uh, chipmunks and so on that live around here to the gorillas of Africa. It's very, very sad, and the elephants and so on, polar bears, whales. I like to say about for the animals that life is alive, all life is alive, and all life is sentient. I was watching some ants that tried to break into my house one day. They came through the woods somehow. Uh, they weren't the carpenter ants, they were the tiny ants. And I 
picked them up over several days, put them in a cup and threw them outside instead of poisoning them. And I also used cinnamon as a deterrent. There are many natural ways to get rid of insects such as ants and other pests around the house. There are always natural ways to get rid of things that we call pests, but they're very good for life. They may not belong in our homes, but they're not really pests. They're integral parts of the environment. And ants are very important to the environment. They eat and take up, uh, get rid of so many things that are deleterious to us. Thank you very much. And uh, so I was watching these ants. And uh, boy, talk about sentience and talk about intelligence. You can't believe how they were doing things with each other and lifting heavy stuff and, 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 and bringing it into wherever they were coming from. It was amazing. The organization, they had a lot of work to do. And obviously intelligence, they had direction, they knew what they were doing. They had a plan. They had things in mind that they were doing. So anyway, I used the cinnamon. My cinnamon was kind of outdated, so it didn't have the pungency that it might have had to work even better. But they didn't like the cinnamon. And I took them day by day out the door. And finally, I don't have any ants anymore. Uh, because when you use those poisons, uh, a they're very bad because then you've got to throw them away and they go into the environment in one way, shape, or form, very toxic. They're very brutal on the animal, terrible death to suffer that way. And uh, you know, so just wanting to be more respectful of life, if at all possible. So life is alive right down to the tiny ant. And we're alive and we're part of that whole animal kingdom. And since life is alive, and since it feels, and since it doesn't want to be hurt or harmed, it will go away from anything that harms it. And since it has all these ways of behaving to get its needs met and a, and a purpose and a direction, it's not supposed to be used or tortured. Life is never supposed to be used or tortured and exploited as we do with animals. And you know what's so sad, too? that sometimes the things we do to animals, especially in research or in the oceans too, when, when we're catching fish with these huge nets that kill everything in the ocean besides catching the fish that we want to eat, can take up everything else that's there and make it die and throw it away. But what's so also sad psychologically, not only that the animals at our uh, at our beckon and at our hand doing these things to them, don't only have to suffer fear and pain and agony, but they have to suffer the humiliation that they can't even die. They can't even die unless we kill them. So they just have to take it like a rabbit whose neck is fastened to a machine and some chemical put in its eyes as it's helpless to help itself. It just has to be humiliated humiliated. And this is what is so extra pathetic about this whole situation. It's kind of like what we do to kids when we shame them or we slap their face. They have nothing they can do but be humiliated. And if we were parenting properly to begin with, we wouldn't get to a stage of needing to shame and humiliate them. But anyway, life humiliating life. How terrible. This life is a hell on earth. This life is a hell on earth. And unfortunately, so much of the hell is humans with what it does to life. And I'm thinking, too, when I speak of this humiliation that I'm talking about, you know, you've probably heard the, the report on that 12-year-old girl recently who was killed by an uncle or, and, and, and the stepfather who grabbed, you know, wanted her to be in a sex ring. You know, how pathetic, the humiliation. The girl had no choice. She was forced. She was brought wherever and ended up being murdered, a passive recipient of the ultimate humiliation at the hands of human beings, just like what we do to animals. It's the dignity of life. Life is supposed to be dignified. It's the dignity of life being put to shame. So... 
it looks like we're running out of time. I guess I started my subject too late. I didn't realize the time because I have so much to tell us, but there is no more time for it right now. I would just hold up this guy's picture and say, doesn't this guy deserve better than to have horrible experiments done on him, this ape? Doesn't this chimpanzee, doesn't he deserve better than to be experimented on, put in refrigerators, have his brain drilled, have his liver toxified? Doesn't he deserve better, ladies and gentlemen? Please be aware of how much animals are suffering. You are not the only animal on the planet. Okay, so we'll stop here for today, and um, I'm going to um, sing a song, and um, I just leave you with this thought uh, to try to be more of a human and what makes a human, and to try to be more conservationist, to use only what you need, don't use more, don't throw paper towels away. Easily take a whole bunch of them, throw them away. Waste water, waste food. In, in, in UK, I just saw the Prime Minister said to people from the podium, do not waste food. We're doing enough wasting. But try to be a human. Starting off with that ohm in the beginning. Try to be a human. Not a consumer. That's not what we're living for. Not a resource and not a statistic. A human. Okay. Now I'm going to ask Ike to come and move my podium for me, if he would, please. You want me to go somewhere? You're going to take it this way? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Benjamin is our cameraman, and he's helped me. We get ready for this show. We have a lot to do. And he's helped me greatly getting ready for this and other shows that we've done. I'm testing my microphone. Okay, are we ready to go? We are ready to go. So first, I will do this. Since we've had this salmonella scare, and since it was thought to be tomatoes, and since I had written a song about tomatoes, I thought that I would sing this to you under the condition. And this is about genetic engineering, and we don't even know if that figures in somehow to the problem with food that we're experiencing right now, but we're certainly going to experience problems with food due to genetic engineering. So here we go. <clears throat> They want to know if a tomato from April is good in November. I want to know, can I eat a tomato from the garden, fresh and strong, rich and pure? Bring it to my mouth and nose and stick it in my mouth. Eat a tomato, ripe, red, and real. Eat a tomato, ripe, red, and real. I don't want it colored or preserved or imported or rotten. Without taste, without juice, what you've got is garbage. Garbage. Feed it to the pigs. No, the pigs won't eat it. They want to know if a cucumber from July is good in December. I want to know, can I eat a cucumber from the garden? Fresh and strong, rich and pure. Bring it to my mouth and nose and stick it in my mouth. 
Eat a cucumber, bright green peel. Eat a cucumber that's really, really real. I don't want it shrunken or preserved or deflated or toxic. Without taste, without juice, what you've got is poison. Poison. Feed it to the cows. Feed it to the pigs, feed it to the homeless people, feed it to the nursing homes, feed it to the school kids. Oh, they might eat it. Now, I'd like to do Also, a rap for you that I wrote and haven't looked at in a long time, so here and there I'll have to read it, but it also somewhat imp it, it goes along with what I have been talking about today. <clears throat> it's called, What's in it for me? They're trying to take it. Oh, way. They're trying to make my day. They're trying to use my pay. Have I got something to say? Have I got something to do? The ocean to me is true. Ah, spirit's what makes me blue. Oh, I've got something to do. Here I'm going to blend a, a purposeful agenda. Propose and mix a tincture to make you want to try. Concentrate a story, no share in any glory. The sad contributory, mud in my eye. Pay to drink the soda, that in your hand you hold a. Pay to get a tolda, to drink the very cola. In which your butt you hold a, the brain you pay to mold a. To plead to get a solda, the green, the blue, the gold a. You're bold, you're can. Mmm, soda. The ocean yet unfolds a. Mutilated brother, breathing with disease. The quality and costa is what we are, we're lost -a. About pollution tosta, toxicity our bossa. Got to be a limit, drive to waste inhibit, profane our place inhibit, let life our planet live it. I will say that part again. The quality and costa is what we are, we're lost -a. About pollution tosta, toxicity our bossa. Got to be a limit, drive to waste inhibit, profane our place prohibit, let life our planet live it. Life, let life live. This group's bubble about to be busted when what is done cannot be trusted. When money is the only only goal, sugar, in every bowl. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. How are we on time? We have three more minutes. So I have to keep talking till the end of time. <laughs>